when did that realization that you had witnessed history, when did that, how did that start to percolate or when did that? It was immediate. I should explain that um, the Japanese attacked the airfields first uh, before going down to Pearl Harbor because we lived in the town of Ohiowa, which is about uh, 13 miles from Pearl Harbor um, and is in the center of the island and um, about a quarter of a mile from our house was Wheeler Airfield which uh, was an army airfield. In those days there was not a separate uh, air force, they were, it was part of the army. And most of our fighters were at, at that field. So Schofield Barracks, which is where I went to kindergarten, was at, outside of Wahiwa, and it was there that we saw big black clouds of smoke coming, and we thought it was realistic maneuvers, and so my brother Tom, who was the oldest in the family, took his bicycle and drove, rode out there. But the further I went on my bike, the more nervous I became. And finally, I stopped after a block and a half and stood at a street corner. You could see the pilots' faces. They mm -hmm. had the, their cockpits were open. That is the, what they call the greenhouse was pushed back. And uh, <clears throat> you could see them looking at you. I saw the rear gunner of the one plane looking at me, and he swung his gun around and shot, and it hit uh, all around my feet, and it hit, uh, it was just like somebody had thrown a, a whole pack of firecrackers at you, but I wasn't struck at all, and I then immediately came back home and told my parents that we were at war, and they still didn't believe me. And we didn't believe him, so we all got in the car and drove out to Schofield, uh, and there was a guard at the, the gate. He was a, a soldier, but to me as a five-year-old at that time, it seemed like he was a grown-up, and he was crying, and that made a big impression on me. I had never seen a, a grown-up cry before. And he told us that it was the attack and we should go home. My father continued to drive into the base, but he was stopped by a military, by an MP, military police. And he said, we're at war, and he said, go home and take cover. It was only at that point that they accepted uh, the reality of the situation. My father was superintendent of the Sunday school, which was uh, just a block from our house. And he had to make sure that nobody came to church or Sunday school. So he went in a plane game and tried to strafe him, but it was in a bad position, and he ran into the manse and the pastor, and uh, they hid one in the fireplace and the other again behind a refrigerator to make sure that the bullets wouldn't get them, and nothing did. We watched uh, from our back door. I remember a plane, a kamikaze plane, flying by the house. I saw it. And then I noticed a plane very low. It was just missing the, the treetops, and I thought it was coming right for our house. And it was close enough so I could see the red circle on the wings and see the pilot. And before I could say anything, the plane suddenly turned um, to the right and then flipped over upside down and disappeared. Uh, below trees about two blocks from our house. The house was on a, a incline so that there was, most houses didn't have basements, but because of the incline we had a stone part under the house so that that gave some protection and my parents dragged mattresses down there and we slept down there at least the first night. For the next Oh, two, three, maybe even four days, there were columns of black smoke coming up from Pearl Harbor. We, um, we couldn't actually see Pearl Harbor where we were, but we knew that it was from Pearl Harbor. We had a shelter built for air raid so that we had to grab our gas masks 
which they supplied us. And when we heard the alarms go off, you had to grab that and run down. They, my dad and, and my brother had dug out a trench, which was made L-shaped so the steps went one way and then it turned a corner so that if they were strafing, the bullets wouldn't hit you. And it was covered with the corrugated metal and uh, dirt over that and they planted something on it. And we'd have to grab our masks and, and run down and sit down there until the all clear came. Uh, and I can remember uh, Gordon, my middle brother, the three-year-old, on his tricycle pedaling madly to get to the hole in the fence so that he could get in and get his mask and get down. I volunteered as a messenger, as did all my friends. And uh, we were issued uh, helmets and gas masks. Uh, um, we were never called upon to do anything, but uh, it was a matter of prestige to go around with your helmet and gas mask because that meant you, you were doing something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't keep track of the number, but I think I gave well over a hundred talks. People were intensely interested in that subject and I think it's surprising how many people still are because we are as far removed from that World War II as I was removed from the Civil War. And so it's ancient history, certainly for young people.